Welcome. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, responsive design and um, there's sort of three elements to a triangle of, of res responsive as we, as we think about this. Brad uh, Bear is going to kick us off and kind of get, get us set up and we're going to make an introduction and he'll go over what we're going to do today. So as Dan mentioned, we're going to go in three different separate areas right here and I'll tell you a little bit about the process. Since this is a workshop, there's actually some work that you get to do um, and we'll hand out little worksheets to do this as well. But uh, to begin with, we're going to do an introduction on the topic. Uh, we'll jump into the little worksheets, workshop exercise, uh, finish with a digital petting zoo, meaning that you can come and check out some of the uh, concepts and websites we're talking about. And then last, we'll have some discussions and questions where you guys can kind of just give us your feedback, tell us stories about your specific museums or institutions, and, and we can do our best to respond. We have no idea what a how-to session is, so we're, yeah. we're going to find out today. So we'll roll with the, roll with the flow. Um, so just want to start out with a, a really interesting little story. Does anybody know uh, Richard Kissel from the Peabody Museum in New Haven? A chance? Okay. So you maybe maybe have heard this or not. Um, he was telling a story about how a student, one of the Yale students, came to him and said, "Hey, I want to propose to my girlfriend uh, by putting a, her like diamond ring in with the rare gems. Can I do that?" And he said, "Yeah, sure, of course." So this like young guy does this, and he takes this, buys this diamond ring, and he puts it in with the gems. And he's like, "I want to write like a placard, you know, with all this good text on there about how I love her and we met and all this." And he's like, "Yeah, sure, fine, whatever." Um, so they did this, and uh, the day comes, and the guy comes in there with a, his soon-to-be, hopefully, fiance, and uh, they walk right up to it, and she looks at it, and she walks away. Um, so he's like, no, no, this is really interesting. You should read this, uh, read this text a little bit here. So she comes back and looks, and uh, she goes away again. So he's like, all right, just read to the end. So uh, moral of the story is that people want information quickly now. They want, don't have to wait till the end. Um, <laughs> They did get engaged, the good news. They didn't ruin their potential, uh, potential matrimony. But um, like I said, the point just being that people, you know, we're in a society where we want information really quickly, responsive, when we want it, how we want it, in the format we want it. Um, and this is just one really good example of this. This is a study that just came out this January, and it says that uh, if you write 110 words on a website, typically 49% of it gets read. So 110 words, not that much. If that goes up to just under 600 words, 593, only 28% of, of it gets read. So the point just being with this is if you're going to spend all this time doing the writing, you're actually not getting that much of a response for all the writing. Uh, I'm probably telling you something everyone already knows. We don't read a lot anymore. Um, so as we transition, just want to talk a little bit about uh, the Eames. And the Eames had this, uh, you know, the furniture couple made a lot of great furniture and design work, and they had this saying, we want to make the best for the most for the least. And this was really good because back in the day you kind of had to pick something that was the best possible approach and kind of one size fits it all. I think with technology now, and we kind of one of the arguments we're going to make that with tech you can give people uh, what they want, when they want, and how they want it. And that's really exciting because we've always wanted to do this with museums. Uh, we've just never quite been able to. Um, so last couple introduction slides before I kind of continue going on. Uh, one really good example of this actually involves kind of the media and television industry. You know, back in the day, everything was based on this prime time. And the prime time was the, the best one size fits all when people would, in theory, watch the television show. Um, what we found is that people now want to watch it on their own time. And they want to be able to watch it on their cell phone, uh, on their tablet, on their computer. It might be at 3 in the morning. It might be at 9 a.m. Uh, and this is really exciting because the television industry has totally embraced this and said, OK, we'll let you stream things whenever is appropriate to you. So the question is kind of, you know, what can we in museums uh, you know, really learn from this? Um, but just so you don't think I'm going completely off my rocker here, you know, I think to do this and understand how we respond to these people, it's important to think about how people learn. And this is something that'll never change. Some people do like reading still. Some people like physical objects. Some people like interacting with other people. Uh, and this is really important to remember that as we're trying to do these and creating the right thing for the right person in the right format at the right time, you still have to know uh, how people are responding. And, and quickly on that, Brad, yeah. with, with those types, one of the things that that particular study shows is that if you take someone who really likes ideas and you can get them interested in an object or in one of these other kinds of uh, uh, you know, areas, that kind of flips them. It really makes a, a very, very indelible experience. So that's one of the things we're really looking for to achieve a really positive and memorable experience. 
So again, you, you all have probably went through this exercise of creating personas. And, and when we do this at Blue Cadet, we think it's important. We say, okay, if people only walk away with one thing, because people will always say, well, we want them to learn this and that and that and that, and that's great. Uh, but what if they only walk away with one thing? What if they only share one thing on social media? What if they only tell their mom one fact? Uh, so we literally make them go through and say, all right, what's the one takeaway that's most important that you want to get? Uh, and we know this is important because, as you can see, the, the time span has gone down just from, you know, in 2,000 people at a 12-second time span on occasion, uh, most occasions, uh, and that's down to eight right now. I don't know that it's ever going to get down to zero, hopefully. Um, <laughs> But it still just makes us think, you know, like if you have one way of delivering information, what's the one most important thing you want people to know? And this goes a lot of the discussion we've had in the course of this museum of analytics and understanding things and seeing how people respond. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about dwell time later, but this is just the concept of like how much time do you want people spending in front of an interactive or a touch screen or a projection? Um, what we've typically found, and if you read the paper, what we found was that uh, if you have a response or a dwell time of less than a minute, you usually have really favorable response. If you have two to three minutes, it gets a little less favorable and all the way down the line. Um, but that said, it's really important to remember the fact that like, while people spend two to three minutes on this particular interactive at the Field Museum, uh, some people still spent 12 to 13 minutes. And that's fine. You just want to give the people that are spending only a minute or two just as good of experience as well. Cool. Any questions so far? Since this is a workshop, I can stop a little bit. Blow on through. Explain it very well. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so I will introduce what I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to talk about the how do they want it. So this is the format. You probably all know responsive design right now. Um, so I'll go into more detail about that. And then, yeah, so when, when do they want it is kind of an interesting question. It really has some, some subsets because it's really like how, how long do you want to look at something? And also, um, you know, what time of day you are. And I think maybe one of the key things is where you are. Um, those are all real important uh, aspects for this, this, this uh, part of the triangle. And I'm going to talk about what we believe is one of the more critical parts of this responsive triangle, and it's what do they want. I think, um, especially I work in education, and I think museum professionals have been trying to craft this recipe forever. Don't worry, I don't have the recipe, I'm sorry, but it's, I think, exploring, um, becoming more audience-centered in terms of the content and responsive to um, emotion and creating memorable experience is something that responsive design can do. So jumping right into how do they want it, um, we all kind of at this point know about responsive design and this basically just means shifting things down to different formats, so your tablet, your computer, uh, your smartphone or whatever. And this is, you know, this is something that's been around for a while and it's finally becoming mainstream. And the thing that's important about this is it's giving one singular experience. You know, when we talk about accessibility or disability, we want to present people with the exact same experience, no matter if they're disabled or not. Uh, this is kind of the same sort of thing. If I walk in with my phone or if I walk in with a, you know, a tablet, uh, I want to be able to have the same experience as if I view the website somewhere else or on a big screen. Um, so the, as I mentioned, this is becoming mainstream. You can see it's happening uh, really great. You don't have to go through different workflows. The color palette, when museums are updating their websites, they only have to do it once. They don't have to do it over and over again for their mobile app and then a tablet app and then their, their computer. Um, but the next question is, you know, what is next? We talk about Google Glass and, and you know, this is a really great image. Um, on the left it says this is the web or what people think is the web right now and that's grown, grown quite a bit. Um, but it continues to grow. So we want to design things in a way that, you know, what if people open it up on the dashboard of their car? What if it becomes an augmented kind of Google Glass sort of thing? Uh, are you going to have to scramble at the last minute and find a way to make it responsive to car dashboards? Um, so it's worth thinking about that now before it even exists. Um, and one example for this that I'll use is, uh, we did this for the uh, Cisneros Foundation, uh, and this is at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. And the interesting thing about this, it's called uh, La Invention Concreta, if you want to download it. Um, but it has one experience when you view it on your tablet, and then once you get to the museum and you have it on your phone, it automatically switches to a wayfinding system. So it makes the guess that if you're looking at it on your phone, you might be interested in looking for wayfinding, there's audio tours, and it's built in. You don't have to go and buy a or get a separate audio tour or anything like that. And before you even get to the museum, we'll talk about journey maps in a little bit, um, you can kind of click some of the pieces you're really interested in so that once you get to the museum, you don't have to say, okay, where is all this at? You can track it on the map. You know where everything is located in advance. 
And this is just kind of creating this similar kind of constant experience, getting people what they need the minute they need it. Um, so you can see this is the, the mobile app, or the mobile experience when you, when you pull it up on your phone. You have your map on the left. There's a little quiz on the right that you can comment on and see what other, other, people, what other people are commenting about the South American abstract modern art. And then when you get home that night, you've kind of tagged pieces you're really interested in. So you can say, okay, uh, I really love this artist. And you don't have to, you didn't have to write it down in your sketchbook. You actually have it online. You can just access it from your, your computer uh, and see the kind of people you liked or the people you're interested in and find out more information. Um, another really good example is, of this is the Rijksmuseum, and they've kind of embraced the fact that they put their collection online. Rather than having people kind of steal it, they have these high-res images on there that you can remix and edit and adjust and play with and put on shirts or coffee cups. Um, so just giving people the information they want instead of saying, all right, they're already stealing it, let's just give it to them and let them do really good things and really good quality images. Um, and you can kind of continue doing different things for this as far as the formatting. Um, this is a website for a university, so slightly different, but one thing that it does is it, um, most students that are coming to a university website at first are obviously checking to see if they want to go to that university, so it's a marketing tool. But the problem is once you become a part of that university, you're, that information isn't relevant to you anymore. So what it's doing is it's reading your IP address based on your location and making a guess if you're on campus or off campus so that you're seeing things as a, a current student as opposed to being a potential student once you're on the campus, most likely. Um, and you can filter back and forth, but again, this is just that one degree of curation so that you're not having to wade through information that isn't relevant. If we think back to the graph about what people read, uh, we're getting rid of that and making it even more poignant for them. And then the last example I'll show here is just, um, this is a large kind of screen format. Um, and this is an experience that you know, can be taken down in size as well too, but um, we're giving people whatever information they're interested in. So if they want to do video, they can sort by video. If they're interested in images, they can do that. There's infographics. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of a beautiful ambient piece as well too. And the accessibility interesting thing about this is that rather than put the screen low for people, uh, you just give them the ability to pull the content down to them. So if they're seven feet tall, that's fine. The content's up there. Uh, if they're a little shorter, they can just pull it down if they're in a wheelchair. So um, really interesting kind of idea of how you play with different screen sizes. So um, went through that really quick, but I can turn it over to Dan now, and he'll tell you a little bit about uh, when do they want it. So Dan? This, this bar is pretty easy. So when, when do they want it? When do you want it? You want it now. So that, that's pretty easy. But as we look at that, we're also looking at you know, this idea of, of how long you're going to be there, who you are. And I think really what's really important is where are you? Um, when, when we start to know where people are, where you are at a given time, that's a very powerful tool. I mean, GPS, oh, I was going to say Malcolm McCulloch, uh, uh, mentions that he, he thinks of smartphones almost as cursors to make the physical world browsable. So it's a really interesting metaphor uh, that my colleague uh, Lori Stepp pointed out to me. Uh, and it's really a great, great way to think about how uh, you know, these smartphones almost start to disappear. They really become a way for us to uh, provide new experiences. But it's really important to figure out uh, where we are. And these days, using the ubiquitous GPS technology we're really taking advantage of uh, things like Google Maps and also uh, experiences that aggregate existing information. Uh, Google Field Trip does this very well. It allows you to sort of make selections so you can make sure you see relevant information. Um, once visitors or, or people that use this see all the information, nobody really wants, wants that, but they want to see relevant in information. Google Now also does this really well, saying there's events nearby. Um, and this can be a very powerful tool, as long as it's giving you what you want, but we'll get you that later. There's also a couple of uh, GPS uh, running apps out there that are really interesting because they track where you go and also can highlight what's nearby. But one of the things that we're still looking at now is, is figuring out indoor location positioning technologies. And, um, oh, can you hand me those things over there? Our, our colleagues from Stories brought the, these iBeacons. Uh, they're actually not iBeacons, I'm sorry. They, are, they're, they're, they use Bluetooth LE, and they're using these throughout this conference to do these push notifications for the Jenny Hol Holzer aphorisms. But it's, so it's very, very accurate technology. It knows, it, it knows when you're nearby, and it can push, push notifications to you. Wi-Fi triangulation is another way where we can really start to figure out where you are in a building. And there's other uh, technologies out there that use existing, well, lights with uh, 
microchips in them that can do pulsed technology and find it with a great degree of accuracy where you are. Some sort of hybrid of all these systems is going to be how we're going to figure out where you are. And these days, using Bluetooth LE and GPS pings, uh, we're able to actually tell which way you're facing. So you can, through the, so the algorithm, with enough pings, they can start to really figure out with a great degree of accuracy where you are, where you're facing, and that's an incredibly powerful tool for a visitor experience to deliver content. Um, also, RFID is, is still being used. Disney's using that right now with a, a kind of a, a way to trigger um, information. That's still out there, too. I think it, you know, having a seamless integration of, of responsive technologies is really uh, what we're, we're hoping for. Uh, people don't have to do much. This just sort of happens. And that really creates that kind of magical experience and very satisfying experience. Another part of when you want it is, is knowing who you are. So websites such as the Franklin Institute are, are using this. It's launching in May. And we'd say, sure, are you an adult or are you with a family? And we're going to give you different options of what you can do and see when you plan your visit. Also, knowing how long you're going to be there. So we ask you, OK, are you going to be here all day? We can sort of give you a, a plan for all the things you might want to do, or recognize the fact that you're only going to be here for a short bit of time. At my museum on the mall, it's very common for visitors to come in. We're a free museum on the National Mall. They'll say, what can I see in 20 minutes? So these are things that we would like to be responsive to. It's not an easy thing to answer. But we have to look at what visitors are looking for now. Even though we're going to figure out where you are, we're going to make the, the design fit to your devices, the most important thing, the key part, is that we give you something that you want. So this next part here, what do you want? That is the, of key importance. If I ping you three times with, with information, I know you're near, and you don't want it, you're probably going to get rid of my, my app pretty quickly. So Emily's going to talk about what do they want. And these are up here for you to, to, to look at. Mm -hmm. So as Daniel said, um, it really doesn't matter if you have the how and the when down perfect. If the content, the what, isn't fulfilling the audience's interests, motivation, or learning style, it really is not working. Um, this is going into the idea of content is king. So when I think about responsive design, I'm thinking about and maximizing the experience to be audience-centered. It's customizable. It's less about all the information that institutions can give in a moment of time. If you think about the super long label and tiny print. It's really about an audience's state of mind and tapping into an emotional moment that is memorable and tailored to a specific experience. So has anyone played with Songza? It's a music generated app. Um, I see a couple hands. Um, the reason why I love it is that I can say it's a Monday morning, I'm a little sleepy, and I'm working, I'm at work. And, a, and then um, a music list is customized based on those preferences and my emotional state at that moment to really improve my mood at that time. And what I love about it is that I think it's a great framework for thinking about how the visitor experience can be more responsive. So thinking about those um, specific comprehensive lists, activities, moods, and then how can um, a museum experience provide, um, through digital means, provide information that really encapsulates and points to that moment in time. So when I think about responsive design, I think about designing for emotion. And um, there, this is an example, a screenshot from Five By, which is very similar to Songza, but instead of music, it's video. So thinking about how can visitor emotion and preference shape and design the experience. So it's less didactic and more responsive to a visitor's interests and needs at a specific moment. How can we create a customizable experience that reacts to visitors' feelings? So something else that we're seeing in responsive design is that it improves based on um, visitor feedback, and it's, it's adaptable. So it's not just a one-size-fits-all. It can change, it can evolve, it has a certain evolution to it. How can we anticipate audience and user preferences before a visit? So thinking about the visit as a continuum and how responsive design can be part of the before and the after and everything in between. 
Language localization, so when we think about responsive design, there are certain means that we have available to filter an experience so that it is customizable. Um, language localization is one of those tools that allows us to include options by way of, of how you want the content delivered. Um, Affinity of Nations app is an app that Daniel is close to Daniel's heart and he can speak a little bit to that. Oh, oh just with that app, the first iteration of that app, which was bilingual, um, the, the, the app uh, set to whatever language you had it set to. So the assumption was if you were a Spanish langu language speaker, you would have a Spanish, Spanish language uh, iPhone and then it would be responsive to your, to your needs. But what we found is we needed to put in a changed language because many people keep their devices on English and they didn't know that there was a, a bilingual or a multilingual guide. So it's just something where it's nice to be responsive, but we can't make assumptions about how mm -hmm. people use their devices. Mm -hmm. Another thing about, yeah. and one other interesting thing about that too is that um, we found that the original idea was just to put like you know English Spanish in the first screen, thinking that you know they'd make the decision and go all the way through. But oftentimes people will walk away from an interactive and then show up a few minutes later. So it's kind of important to be able to toggle through a language as well too. If you give them that option three quarters of the way through, if someone comes up and being able to change it, yeah, and keep and keeping the design consistent, so it's always you can always know where to look for it. Yeah. So something that is familiar to most of our hearts, the remote. So thinking about user experience and re responsive design within this framework, think about, think about the buttons that you use on a remote. Do you, how many, I mean, I, can, I could probably use maybe four buttons. And so, so it's kind of the like everything in the kitchen sink. That, send, that tends to be some of the experiences that I've, um, I've kind of dealt with in, in the museum realm is that we got to give, we got to put everything on the same app with all, and we'll have different layers. But really thinking about the different skill sets and scaffolding that experience so that for the novice, maybe you do have, for me, I just need the five buttons and then you have the expert and then you can have more of a, a more complex experience. Do you want to talk about this image? Sure. Since yeah. First off, Emily color coordinated her attire with this image today, too, by the way, which oh, is yeah. pretty fantastic. I am, I am the screen. I was going to, too, but I, I thought it'd be too much if we all, all did it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating idea. Like, I think about my grandparents, and they use power up, power down, channel up, and, or power, channel, and volume, and that's about it. Um, and that's great for them, but the problem is they really struggle when there's all kinds of buttons on a remote control. So what if it's just as easy as you toggling back and forth between being a novice and being a, a veteran or a, you know, a grizzled remote user uh, so that you can switch back and forth by how many buttons you actually need? And that's, this was an image from a Fast Company article, and they were just saying this could become the tendency of if I walk in a museum, uh, you know, I'm a young person or I'm an adult, what if I could just kind of toggle my skill level based on uh, what I'm looking for that day? And also, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this idea in design of the paradox of choice. So you give people 30 mm -hmm. choices, they're probably not going to make any of those choices. Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you give them a few, they're more likely to be directed. Mm -hmm. And this really speaks to what museums need to do. We have to look at what visitors want versus what we want to, mm -hmm. to tell them or, or have mm -hmm. them do. So in kind of a simple example, this is a non-museum example, obviously, but Despicable Me, Minion Rush, this app allows you to um, opt in your birthday, and then it also adapts the experience based on your skill level. Um, and so this is just kind of a simple way of thinking about how, uh, how this could manifest in a digital experience. So planning responsive content. BuzzFeed quizzes, if you think about it. So again, it's thinking about as you're planning for content that's responsive, thinking about the visit as a continuum, the beginning, the end, and everything in between. So if um, responsive content in the museum experience, there's some sort of anticipation so that there's information that more than likely your audience is giving you. But then thinking about how that can, experience can be adaptable, how it can change. So if you're a repeat visit, if you're opting in, I just came um, last week, then figuring out a way in which that, that content can adapt based on, based on your previous experience. So thinking about responsive content is identifying the needs and motivation of your visitors. But I really wanted to underscore show that responsive content mean, means that you're showcasing empathy and you're being social. So if you think about your BuzzFeed quiz, what, your, um, what um, Game of Thrones character would you be? If you think about that type of how they're scaffolding the information, I think that's a really interesting framework for thinking about um, 
how we can kind of anticipate the needs and motivations of our audiences through a digital experience. Um, in terms of customization, this is, uh, this is at the MFA Boston, um, at which, of which I, I don't work at, but I, I found this really great where they, um, they invited uh, audiences to select the works at crowdsourcing, which is an, an incredibly innovative thing for us to be thinking about. This is, but this is a very kind of core to the responsive framework, thinking about having there be a very direct impact based on what you're selecting. So visitors could select their, the, um, the images that they believe should be installed in the exhibition. So it's, a, it's just an example of what's core to the responsive triangle. And again, with this, and the, the ultimate impacts of being responsive with your content is that you're going to have a longer dwell time um, because um, audiences will have a deeper, more relevant engagement, and then the, the experiences will be exceedingly more accessible and inclusive. Um, so planning responsive content, thinking about starting small. So what's one little slice in your institution that you can think about having, really blowing up the idea of the content you're giving and being truly audience-centered? One of the ways is crowdsourcing, which I gave an example previously, but also involving community voices in your planning process of the content. So really flattening the idea of what expertise is. And, and if you want your content to be responsive, involving visitor panels, focus groups, to really craft that content for your target audiences. And then journey maps is also something that we want to um, discuss. Oh, yeah. well. uh, there's a little, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide yeah. as well. But at the Smithsonian, our South Mall uh, campus, we did uh, 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 some journey maps, which was creating personas and really trying to look through the eyes of visitors, what they'd see, what they'd expect. And, and the, big, the big thing that we're looking at is looking beyond just that threshold of when they enter the museum, but pre-visit. What are they doing to get there? How, you know, how do they find parking? How are they researching? What, what are they doing? And then also the post-visit. But all these are really, really important. The threshold experience, um, which Ross Perry was talking about yesterday, uh, is really, really important to think about as well. How do you set up these experiences? How do people, how do you pre prepare the audience? I mean, it's not like you're in a theater and the lights go down, but we want to make sure that we have a receptive audience for what we're about to have them engage in, hopefully. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, your turn. So this is the how-to session part of this session. <laughs> well, and, and the, first, if there are any burning questions or comments, uh, we, uh, oh, yeah, we're, yeah. you're happy to uh, raise your hand or shout them out. I'd love to hear from you. Not burning, but I'm curious. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm wondering if there are ways um, for people to sort of choose their experience without sort of self-selecting as a novice or as an expert. Mm -hmm. I know that I would be really hesitant, even though I might be more satisfied with a novice experience, mm -hmm. I might be really hesitant to select or sure. to say that I am. Mm -hmm. One really good way of doing this is actually instead of saying what how old are you is like giving them questions and seeing how they respond if they get the first two right for instance you know maybe they're like a higher skill level if they miss the first two or something like that you know you need to cut it back a little bit so it can kind of be like real time analytics that you're responding to the way people are answering things or their tendencies if you give them a first some choices early on like if you're more interested in A than B uh, and by making those decisions then you're kind of self identifying as something and you can cater the rest of the experience to them. No, I, I think that's a, a great insight mm -hmm. that we have to look really closely at what we're asking, you know, visitors to, to choose and then see how they, they respond. So we have um, developed, or I should say the royal we, Brad has put together this very groovy uh, worksheet here that he's going to pass out. And, well, he's not going to pass out, he's going to actually hand out the uh, uh, worksheet. And um, what we'd like you to do is uh, why don't you form groups of a few people, we'll make this a little more interactive so we don't put pressure on each person, but uh, meet your neighbor, uh, why don't you form groups of, uh, of five people or so, and uh, let's, let's try to think about um, how we can create a scenario um, and how we can make that responsive. <laughs> 